This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. This show is a lot like eggnog. Maybe you love us, maybe you hate us, but either way, you've gotta respect how chaotic the whole concept is. Tonight, a look back at how the year's biggest story changed the course of 2020. Plus, with all of this talk of 5G conspiracies, we unpack what's fueling the distrust around new telecommunications tech. But first, here's what you need to know right now. If you thought we were done with Congress white knuckling end of the year deadlines, think again. Tonight, the House voted to override the president's veto of a military spending bill, marking the first override of Trump's presidency. We also just saw the House vote to increase stimulus checks to Americans from $600 to $2,000. Washington did breathe a sigh of relief after the president put aside his late game gripes over the COVID relief and funding bill and signed that into law Sunday. But his push for $2,000 stimulus checks for each American and the Democrats' long-running support for that move put lawmakers back at the negotiating table and put many Republicans opposed to those bigger checks in a tricky position. President Trump's signature over the weekend prevented a government shutdown that would have started tomorrow, but the delay in signing the bill led to an estimated 14 million jobless Americans losing a week of unemployment benefits after two relief programs expired. The $600 checks for Americans included in the already signed bill were set to go out as soon as this week, but with payments potentially increasing, the Treasury Department may hold until Congress makes its decision. Officials are investigating the motive behind the bombing in downtown Nashville on Christmas morning. The bomb was detonated inside an RV, killing the bomber, injuring three others, and damaging 40 buildings. Metro police are investigating whether the AT&T building where the RV was parked was the intended target. Federal investigators are also looking seriously into whether the paranoia over 5G technology was part of the motive. Nashville's mayor weighed in on that today. Well, I think if you live in Nashville, you have to, you have to think there has to be some connection. Why would you drive to Antioch to Second Avenue? and park next to an AT&T facility. Again, that's why the questions of motivation will clearly take a long time to establish. Notably, the FBI hasn't designated this as an act of terrorism, since the motive would have to be tied to some kind of ideology to do so. And, well, law enforcement isn't sure about that. The investigation into the bombing is still ongoing, but one thing Metro Police are sure of the RV played an audio recording of a countdown warning people to evacuate before the explosion, all while playing the 1964 song Downtown by Petula Clark, whatever that means. As we finish out 2020, consider the toll of COVID-19 in the US this year. We're now up to over 19.1 million reported cases and more than 333,200 deaths and officials are worried that holiday travel could make things worse. Some states are still dealing with the virus surge that followed Thanksgiving, and in the next few weeks, we'll see what kind of impact December's holiday travel will have on numbers. More than 7.1 million people were screened at TSA checkpoints between December 19th and the 26th. That's the highest number of recorded travel of any period since the beginning of the pandemic. The glimmer of hope in all of this is, of course, the vaccine rollout, still in its early stages. Updated projections show the U.S. will likely fall short of the goal of having 20 million people vaccinated by the end of 2020. A count by the CDC from over the weekend shows that 9.5 million doses have been distributed and about 1.9 million people have been vaccinated. Even with some delays in reporting these numbers, that puts us behind the 20 million target laid out by the federal government's Operation Warp Speed. When you've had a year like we've had, it's worth considering some retrospection. The pandemic was one of those rare stories that affected everything in the past year. And it's tough to get a full view of its impact without taking a broad view. Newsy's Lindsay Thies did just that. 2020 is coming to an end on an optimistic note as approved COVID vaccines are deployed. It is such a moment of hope because we can see the light. We can see the the end of this pandemic. It's the beginning of the end. But the virus redefined the past year and left millions scarred. I will never be the same because of this experience. What we knew in March and February is a lot different than what we know now. This time, last year, the virus was just beginning to circulate in Wuhan, China. 
as we counted down the final hours of 2019, the virus was beginning to spread. And authorities are still baffled by the fast spreading coronavirus that has killed at least four people and sickened more than 200 in China. By the end of January, Wuhan would enter a lockdown that would last until April, but not before the virus was spreading overseas. The first case in the U.S. would be detected on January 20th. We have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China, and we have it under control. It's uh, going to be just fine. President Donald Trump created the Coronavirus Task Force. He praised Chinese President Xi Jinping for his transparency, and he limited travel, but did not completely stop it from hotspots abroad. So we are officially quarantined for 14 days in Japan. Cruise ships became floating petri dishes. Several loaded ships were stranded, sometimes with no place to dock. In February, the virus got a name, COVID-19. It began wreaking havoc in Europe. Hospitals filled, cases in Italy and Spain surged past China. March 11th, the WHO finally declared a pandemic, hinting at a grim reality the U.S. would soon face. First, an outbreak at a Seattle nursing home, then New York City. I hate to say this, but it's true. We are now the epicenter of this crisis right here in the nation's largest city. Overnight, schools, businesses, and streets in the largest U.S. city emptied as state and local officials began issuing stay-at-home orders. Hospital workers scrambled to secure ventilators and beds. Americans were asked to conserve PPE for frontline healthcare workers. And the USNS Comfort docked in the city on March 30th to provide some relief for hospitals. We're here by choice, and we have to get to work, and whatever it takes to get through our day, then we do it. Despite dire warnings, the U.S. had enough ventilators. But throughout March, the gravity of the situation deepened. Several states declared states of emergencies. One by one, sports leagues on the collegiate and professional level suspended or canceled their seasons. On March 24th, the IOC suspended the 2020 Summer Olympics in Japan until 2021. This is a pandemic. I felt it was a pandemic long before it was called a pandemic. Americans were desperate for tests. Lines stretched for miles. Millions lost their jobs. In a five-week span, more than 26 million people filed for unemployment. That's more than all the jobs added since the Great Recession. Congress passed a $2 trillion stimulus package. By the start of April, roughly 1 million COVID-19 cases had been confirmed globally. By the end of April, the U.S. had confirmed that many cases on its own, and the global death toll climbed above 200,000. One day I had four or five patients die. It's a lot of death. Unlike other countries, the situation has only worsened in the U.S. Peak after peak after peak of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. I wish everyone understood how bad this disease was, but they don't. We had nurses work. 14 days straight, whatever they had to do to help take care of our, all of our patients. Our new reality, shaped by face masks, disinfectant wipes, hand sanitizer, social distancing, and the worst kind of goodbyes. When you have a patient taking their last breaths in a bed, and you have a family member yelling through an iPad, uh, through an iPad screen, trying to wake their family member up, that's something you don't forget. 2020 ends with daily deaths topping 9-11. The effort to vaccinate the country is ramping up, but for now, the year ends with the same advice. Wear a mask. For Newsy, I'm Lindsay Thies. When you're back, we'll unpack a conspiracy theory that's popped back up in the wake of the Christmas Day bombing in Nashville. Investigators are still saying that any number of things could have motivated the Nashville bomber to blow up his RV and himself on Christmas morning. But what we do know is that law enforcement is reportedly looking into one theory in particular, that the bomber was driven by belief in conspiracy theories around 5G. Now, to most people, 5G is just a new generation of telecommunications tech to bolster cell service. But to a certain slice of the conspiracy crowd, 5G is a lot more nefarious than that. And that thinking isn't just found in the U.S. Reporter Jake Godin of our award-winning Newsy Bellingcat series explains. Essentially, people think that either 
5G cellular network towers are spreading COVID-19 either by weakening people's immune systems uh, due to the, the waves from them, or even like COVID like attaches itself to the like airwaves that, you know, are caused by these 5G towers. There's been 77 phone masts have been attacked in the United Kingdom and throughout Europe as well. Uh, the Netherlands have had like 16, I think, the last number I read, and then Ireland's had a few, and Belgium, Italy, Cyprus, Sweden have all had like minor incidents with towers. And the United States is worried, you know, Department of Homeland Security, FBI, is worried that it's going to come here to the United States. And in fact, some towers have been vandalized here in the States, it mainly started in the UK. There's a video on Facebook that w went around. It was like going viral. It's a guy who was in Britain and he was staring up at a tower. He's holding a chipset, a motherboard. Then he shows it to the camera and it has like COV-19 on it. Mm -hmm. and it's on this little gray square. Perhaps the best thing is for me to show you. It's best if I just show you, look. It's a piece of IG kit and it says COV-19 on it. But if you look, I, there's a lot of clues within the video that show that it, and uh, quite a few people have gone through this already uh, and debunked this, but there's quite a few clues that point to that, the fact that like this chipset, this motherboard, is just from like a tabletop television uh, box. It's like from a cable box. Mm -hmm. The guy like found, took his from home or found an old one, took it apart, took out the motherboard, noticed it said COVID-19 or COVID-19 on it or put it on there himself. Mm -hmm. And it's just like pulling people's strings, but it's also just driving, it's like pouring fuel on this conspiracy theory because people are believing it you know we all know about that spectrum where it's like this is radioactive x-ray etc this is visible light this is like radio waves well 5g is over there with the radio waves in terms of like the length it's it's like harmless in that sense if 5g was harmful to you yeah, radio waves would also be harmful to you satellite uh tv all this other stuff that's like way over there on that end of the spectrum would also be harming us and we'd have you know built up science evidence on this a virus is a physical thing it literally cannot attach itself to a, a radio wave or a 5g wave so it's going to cause actual damage to telecom infrastructure uh if people keep on attacking it like they are it's also causing the engineers working on this stuff to be threatened it, you know it just sows distrust the idea of antibody therapy to treat COVID-19 was a promising and actually pretty uplifting concept. The thought that the blood from one person who recovered from COVID could help someone else through their fight is one of the few bits of positive inspiration you could pull out of this pandemic. But recent reporting has shed some light on the limits of this treatment and raised questions about how it could be more effective. Let's check back in with our favorite health reporter, Lindsay Thies, for more. Two FDA antibody drugs with emergency approval could help keep COVID patients out of the hospital, but thousands of doses are sitting unused across the country. It's been a bit frustrating over the course of the last month or two. Dr. John Hammer is an infectious disease specialist in Denver, Colorado. He says one issue, many are missing that sweet spot when they can get the medicine for it to work best in the first week of illness. Treatments have to be given via an IV, and getting IV centers up to administer it is also difficult. Hammer's been waiting on that to begin his study for the Eli Lilly drug. We have a place where we could do it uh, that would be safe uh, for providers and for patients, but we just can't get the staffing or haven't been able to, to get it up and running to date. These antibody treatments were highly praised to help at-risk COVID patients from getting severely sick, especially after President Donald Trump received Regeneron's antibody cocktail when he was hospitalized for COVID back in October. It was like unbelievable. I felt good immediately. HHS numbers show of the more than 530,000 doses available, only a little more than half, some 290,000 doses have been shipped to hospitals. Even less is getting two patients. Only 5% to 20% of doses have been used. There's also some cost confusion. Under the deals the drug makers made with the federal government, the doses are free, but depending on insurance coverage, patients may have to pay for administering the drug. The NIH and Infectious Disease Society of America have said there's not enough data to recommend either treatment. Hospital pharmacist Newsy spoke with said that that uncertainty may play into some patients passing up on the treatment. Bottom line, more research and data needs to be done. So if someone is considering if they want either antibody drug, they should consult their doctor. 
maybe about a clinical trial. You may or may not get the agent, but at least it will give us um, data as to whether these agents actually work uh, for you and for others. Lindsay Thies, Newsy, Denver. When you're back, we're going to take a moment to reflect on this year before... I started surfing when I was five years old. 2019, um, oof, um, was a, a crazy year. There's three American girls competing for the top two Olympic spots. Yeah, I was first in the rankings, but the points were so close. Like, who's gonna win the world title? There's only two Olympic spots and they're gonna finish one, two, and three in the world. Like, sucks whoever gets third. Yeah, it was very, very close. I could go into this and come out with nothing. So looking back on 2020, here's a question to think through. What did we learn from all of this? And no, I'm not talking about the global pandemic, a new civil rights movement, or this show's minimalist set design. I'm talking about the other, other big story of 2020, the election. Newsy Stephanie Liebergen dug into the lessons learned from a wild election year and how election officials are already working to apply them to the years ahead. With the 2020 election behind us, officials are looking to learn from what worked and what didn't. I think secretaries of state and others really stepped up and voters really leaned in as well and, and responded beautifully and brilliantly by adapting the ways that they vote. Our elections were secure. Uh, the results were an accurate reflection of the will of the people. Uh, they were a reflection as well of, of significant turnout uh, and significant engagement among voters this year. Newsy reached out to election officials around the country. Only Democratic secretaries of state got back to us, and all of them celebrated changes that they feel made voting easier and more accessible. What changes did your state make this year that you would like to see continue in the future? Um, well, surprisingly to us, there was strong support for vote by mail. Vermont was one of four states that automatically mailed ballots to all registered voters because of the pandemic. And Arizona and Minnesota were among the states that allowed elections officials to start processing mail-in ballots earlier this year. Our normal rule was a one-week head start. In Minnesota, we had that two-week head start. I suspect that that's something we will talk about extending into the future because it really made for a much smoother election day and maybe more importantly, post-election period as well. But some conservatives warn that states should be encouraging people to continue voting in person. If you go to a polling place, you go vote in person. If there's a question, if there's an issue, those can be addressed in real time. If you cast your ballot by mail, you don't necessarily get to address those problems. One of the biggest challenges officials in both parties faced was misinformation and the contentious environment that extended well beyond Election Day. That's according to the chair of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, who is an appointee of President Trump. There's a lot of work that needs to go into helping people uh, learn more and understand more about the election process, particularly uh, the process and all the work that goes in uh, to certifying and finalizing the results. I think the damage that's being done by all of these accusations and, um, you know, just working to undermine the integrity of the election is, is going to have a, a wide impact far beyond this election. Uh, the knocks on election officials, the threats that, that people have received. Civil servants doing their job should not be threatened. Americans also changed the way they got involved with the election, a change officials hope will stick around. You know, we had a, a, a lot of young poll workers, a lot of first time poll workers that had never done that. I think it'll be important to continue to keep those people engaged. Stephanie Liebergen, Newsy, Miami. In 2021, we're going to a place we haven't been in a while. If you guessed outside, you're close, but we're going a little further than that. While you ponder on that, feel free to hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. Better to talk trash there since we ain't doing the whole face-to-face -face thing. Twenty twenty put the clamps down on a lot of activities, but not space exploration. This year, the U.S. had an all-American launch for the first time in almost a decade. 
American astronauts blasted off from America in an American rocket. Not only that, but the International Space Station celebrated 20 years of no vacancies. It's had folks in the ISS continuously for two decades. National reporter Mai Rodriguez tells us how 2021 will bring a new focus back to the moon. It's easily one of the most visible of the celestial bodies, the moon. And next year, the journey to get humans back there begins once again. Ultimately, it fulfills our need to explore. Chow Lindgren is a doctor and an astronaut, and one of the 18 recently chosen for NASA's new Artemis program to get humans, including the first woman, to the lunar surface by 2024, something that hasn't happened since the Apollo 17 mission back in 1972. I think all of us in the astronaut office uh, are in one way or another influenced by those iconic images of our Apollo astronauts exploring the moon. Returning to the moon is seen as a necessary stepping stone to getting humans to Mars in the 2030s. The Artemis team will be working on lunar-related projects, both in orbit and on the surface of the moon, that can eventually be applied to a future Martian mission. Uh, the moon offers a wealth of scientific discovery still, and also offers a wealth of operational discovery, helping us to refine the procedures, the equipment, um, and the skills that are needed to be able to land, to explore uh, successfully on a rocky surface, and then to come back to the Earth. The missions also have the potential to create technological advancements for everyone on Earth. The whole world benefits from those things, and, and the, the benefits from Apollo are innumerable, you know, from, from the computers, the, the, the miniaturization of computers and on, um, you can count all those. That was really a, a turning point in, in history for technology. NASA's Artemis program hopes to eventually create a permanent human presence on the moon's surface, similar to the current full-time human presence on the International Space Station and Lindgren could be among them. Such a privilege to be a part of this. In Washington, I'm Maya Rodriguez. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back for more in the loop tomorrow, same time, same place. More top stories from Newsier headed your way right now.